Remember to subscribe to Coming Up Next, my friends, at comingupnext.com.au. You know what it's going to do. It's going to streamline your podcast listening experience. You'll get interviews like my interview this week with Liv Hewson directly into your device. And all you've got to do is head to comingupnext.com.au, select the platform that you listen to podcasts on, and hit that magical subscribe button. <laughs> Greetings, my friends, out there in the podcast universe. It's me, Alistair. I'm your host. This is Coming Up Next, the podcast. And another cracking episode this week coming up for you. Um, But if you haven't listened to last week's episode, you can find it at comingupnext.com.au. It was an interview with a filmmaker named Dan Knight. Uh, Dan has uh, just premiered. A, uh, a project 15 years in the making called Trollbridge uh, premiered uh, in the public at, uh, at Flickrfest in Sydney. And uh, I was really keen to speak with Dan about what it takes, the kind of persistence, the kind of, uh, I guess, mental war games you have to play with yourself when you're, uh, when you're so heavily invested in a project. So comingupnext.com.au to find that one and all the other episodes. Joe Berlinger the week before, um, one of the greatest documentary filmmakers of all time. Um, Yeah, they're all there. They're all free. And while you're there, you can subscribe to the show as well. My guest this week, Liv Hewson. You may know their work from uh, Santa Clarita Diet, which is on Netflix. Uh, They've also been in Top of the Lake, most recently Homecoming Queens. We've had Corey Chen and uh, Michelle Law speaking about that as well. Uh, You may know their work from back in very small business. Uh, they're doing amazing work, both in front of and behind the camera. Um, you know what, let's just get into it. I'm really excited to, uh, to share this week's episode with you, my chat with Liv Hewson. I saw uh, at the Melbourne Film Festival last year, uh, I went to mm. the, the shorts program and I saw Let's See How Fast This Baby Will Go. Oh, yeah. Um, and I remember being completely blown away by the film and, and the performance, well, your performance in it. Um, Thank I, you. I guess it was only really in uh, starting to do a bit of research that I, re- that I made the connection that this was the person that I was going to be uh, interviewing. Oh wow, really? Um, well, obviously, you know, I knew I knew about your other sort of uh, body of work. So I, I guess um, from that, it must have been a pretty, uh, I guess, big whirlwind from from there to now in terms of the way that things have, I guess, played out for you as uh, in your career. Sure, yes. We filmed Let's See How Fast This Baby Will Go in early 2016. So I had, um, I had, I had done some work. I'd, like, I'd filmed Drama World, a show that I was in in South Korea um, in 2015, and uh, I had been working on Top of the Lake in Australia. I'd done like a small spot on a film that sh- shot in Vancouver. So like I was doing a little bit of stuff. I was like um, settling into being an actor, like for a living. Like I wasn't, wasn't working any day jobs. I was just kind of like, oh, this is my life. I'm finding the rhythm of that. And then um, I actually was, I, I was finding out that I was going to do Santa Clarita Diet um, while we were filming. Let's see how fast this baby will go. So it's, it occupies um, this sort of like strange, beautiful moment in the last few years for me making that. It's pretty incredible. Uh, and you grew up in Canberra. I did. Do you remember, were you like, I know that you were in um, the Canberra Youth Theatre, but yes. were you someone who was like always performing as a, as a kid? Were you like, did, did you have a big family or was it quite a sort of contained experience? Um, I, I, come from like a, I come from a pretty small family. My, it's my parents. Um, I'm a middle child in the middle of two boys. Uh, so it was like the three of us and my parents growing up. Um, and our, our parents always like, they're both, um, 
public servants, but my parents really fostered a love of storytelling and an appreciation for storytelling in the house. Like we were always surrounded by music and like, and film. And like, we would go, my parents would make an effort to take us to see plays and like take us to see films that maybe you wouldn't take your kids to see normally. Like we were constantly exposed to um, and encouraged to enjoy um, storytelling. So I always loved it. it. It was always like surrounded, surrounded my growing up and it was very natural. And I, I, I knew I wanted to be a performer, I think when I was nine, um, and I was in a school play for the first time. And I was like, yeah, this is it. This will do. This is, <laughs> this is all I'm interested in. What was the play? Um, it was a musical called uh, Pandora's Box. And it, it was like, um, a, it was a bunch of Greek myths all smashed together around like, because, um, you know, the, the myth of Pandora's Box being like, she gets married, opens the box, evils are released into the world. But the in the play, like all, all of the famous Greek myth characters are there at her wedding. And then um, they branch off and like experience the different evils she released and the audience lines about different myths and stuff. And I played Perseus, who is like the human hero who um, kills Medusa. And that was, that was the first thing I ever did. I drew, I drew a moustache on myself with eyeliner and I was like, yep, good to go. This is the rest <laughs> of my life. Thanks. And you never stopped drawing moustaches on. It's true. I didn't. <laughs> I kept doing that for a long time. Um. So was it where were you like, Mum, Dad, I know I'm nine, but I'm off to be an actor, or was it something that sort of evolved over time? No, I think from that point on, it, it was just like whenever an adult asked me what I was interested in, or like, well, what do you think you want to be when you grow up? I was like, well, I want to be an actor. That's that's it. That's what I want to do. And of course, like everyone was like, mm, all right, okay, well, that's nice. Um, but my my parents were always very. Um, supportive of all three of us in whatever we wanted to do I think if I I've always described my parents as empowering um in that they they really kept an eye on what any of the three of us was was passionate about or good at or interested in and really ran with it so um I think my my mother in particular when I was about 13 13 or 14 um had really by that point <laughs> realized that like oh this is this is serious. Like this, <clears throat> this interest and this passion for this thing is, is really like intense and going to take you somewhere. So she was the one who actually like looked around town for like theater workshops and like avenues for me to just do it more. Not even with the mindset of like, Oh, well, you're going to learn how to do this for a living, but just like, Oh, you're good at this and you like this. So like, let's pursue it some more in the same way that if I had expressed interest about playing a sport, she would have looked up where I could play the sport in town. And that's when we found Canberra Youth Theatre, and that's when I started working with them. And did you find the experience to be quite nurturing? Did you feel like there was quite a rich vibe for artistic people in Canberra? I, I'm very lucky in that, like, I, I really found my spot. Um, I, I credit Canberra Youth Theatre in particular and, like, the people that I knew there and the time that I spent there. <laughs> And the resources that I had access to there, I really think that taught me most of what I know as an actor. And I, I continued to study it at school, um, but really where I like, cut my teeth performance skill-wise was like in, in studying theatre and performance outside of school um, with that company. Right. What sort, of, uh, what sort of stuff were they teaching you and what sort of shows were you putting on? Um, they had access. We had access to like workshops we could sign up for for a semester. Um, there was, uh, there was like a, an actors ensemble for a senior age group that I, senior age group, like 18 to 25, that I was invited to be a part of when I was a little bit younger. Um, so I started like, I started performing and developing shows with them, um, on a weekly basis. And that was, that was really lovely. I, we studied, I was learning with them for years. So over the time I was there, um, I had access to, like Stanislavski stuff, um, Laban and movement and viewpoints and um, Shakespeare and like devised theatre, modern playwrights like Sarah Kane. Um, I wrote some things, um, developed some things with a group. And, and so I was, I, I went from like going to workshops after school and like sort of just learning what I could, whether it was like um, 
improv or like comedy or drama or like whatever happened to be there I was just like eating it up I was so thirsty for it and then um by the end of my time there I had had uh my first kind of experience with touring a play um I auditioned for and was cast in a play that we then took to Sydney and Melbourne and that was an amazing formative experience because um I think I was 15 or 16 at the time and that taught me so much about just like the logistical reality of like traveling for work and, and performing in new places. And so I really learned so much in my time there that um, carried forward into, into how I do my job now. Had you spent much time outside of Canberra at that point? No, I hadn't. I hadn't. So it must have been um, pretty mind-blowing, I guess, as well. Maybe not mind-blowing. Totally. But mind altering to step outside of Canberra and into Melbourne and Sydney, not only from a like working point of view, but just uh, from an experiential point of view. Yeah. My, I have, um, my grandparents have always lived in Sydney and like my aunt, um, lives in Melbourne. So like I had done, I had done like family visits to both of those cities before, but to enter, to enter that space as like, um, it was like my first taste of like entering a, a big city as a professional, I guess. Um, and that was really, yeah, mind altering. Yeah. So when did you start working on, uh, on Drama World? We shot that um, in October and November of 2015. So I, I had, um, I finished year 12 in 2013 and I knew I wasn't going to go to university. I had no intention of doing that. And then I, I spent a year um, sort of doing like independent film stuff and like writing, writing plays and just working with my friends and doing sort of like indie stuff for about a year. And I was doing more workshops still. And so I started working with an organization in Sydney that offered me an opportunity to come to a workshop in Los Angeles for six weeks in the start of 2015. And at the time for me, I was like, well, I've, I mean, I've finished school. I've sort of got nothing on. <laughs> like, okay. Um, going to America to work had never occurred to me uh, as, as something that I was thinking about. Like I, ha I had never grown up thinking, oh, I should go to the States one day. Like it was not in my field of vision, but I went and I learned um, heaps. It was so useful. And uh, I signed, I signed with a manager over there. And then she introduced me to um, the man who is now my Australian manager. And so going into 2015, I had representation for the first time. It's pretty incredible. So I started, or, yeah, it was, it was nuts. It was an absolute whirlwind. So then I started auditioning for projects in um, both America and Australia. And Drama World was casting for Claire, the character that I played, uh, with the, out of the States. So I sent in a, a self-tape. I recorded myself performing the scenes on my phone on my friend's um, front porch while the sun was setting and the lighting was terrible and the sound was bad and it was just awful. But I sent that in and they, and they gave me the job, so it must have been okay. And then um, I, I, met the, I met the creators over Skype. We talked about the character and the project some more. I signed on to do it and then I got on a plane to Seoul. Wow. And we, and we made the show. Now that must have been pretty uh, mind-blowing. It was, yeah, it absolutely was. It was wonderful. Um, it's, a, it's an experience that I, I hold very fondly. I mean, as, as an actor, because, you know, you've had quite a lot of success uh, at, at a young age. What do you kind of um, attribute that to? And I don't mean in a kind of uh, esoteric sense, but the, the sort of things that I guess you learned at the Canberra Youth Theatre, um, I'm assuming, you know, things like work ethic as well as mm -hmm. presence and truth and, and stagecraft. Um, what, what, are the, what are the sort of things that you feel have kind of uh, allowed you to take advantage of these opportunities? Work ethic is a big one. And um, the, the understanding that, like, you, you can be as talented as you like, but that's only half of the equation. You also have to be reliable and and um giving and like nice to work with and like pleasant to be around like there's you have to work on yourself as much as you work on um your skills and uh, i think sometimes people forget that i think sometimes people get romanced by the idea of the sort of talented uh 
genius who's also a train wreck. It's like, well, that person probably doesn't work very much. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Your time is also very well served, like going to therapy or like meditating or whatever it is, or, or like making sure that you're in a stable enough place to trust yourself as a performer and, and to like to handle the work you need to do. That's really important. Mm, yeah. um, so I, I think um, the biggest gift that, that the last few years have given me is that I, I feel very stable and very sure of myself. And I think um, if possible, it's amazing to work towards a feeling of being capable, like acknowledging that you're capable, like cultivating all of the skills you need and then resting in the certainty that like, you've got this, it's okay. Like, I know I can do this. And that sounds so simple. The idea that like really acknowledge that I know I can do this, but it is a very grounding feeling. I think so much of, um, so much of what I attribute, um, working to, I guess, is being, is being grounded in yourself and in the work you're doing. It's, uh, it's a pretty incredible perspective to have, uh, in your early twenties, I think. (laughs) <laughs> um, I mean, I'm in my coming into my mid thirties and it's like, now I'm, now I feel like, yeah, I think I'm kind of getting a grasp of, of, of what you're saying. Um, and I think, yeah, I think being kind of unpretentiously, uh, grounded and confident is, um, mm. is certainly a good way to just make things about the work as opposed to about kind of ego driven agendas. Oh yeah. Leave your ego at the door as much as you can, anytime you can, whether you're like at work or with a friend or alone in a room, you know, you don't need it. (laughs) You don't need it. No, it doesn't really serve you. It protects you. No, it does. It does. But, but I think, you know, it's also good to think about what, what do I think I need protection from? What am I trying to protect myself from? Yeah. So what was the experience like of uh, landing in Seoul and, and shooting drama world? It was magical. It was so, I'd never done anything like it. I had never um, spent any time in Asia before. It was my first uh, job of that size. I was kind of like at the, at the front of a project for the first time. And it was a very unique experience. I, I, the people that I met, <clears throat> the people that I met making Drama World, a lot of them I'm still very close friends with to this day. Like I'm still in um, a group chat on my phone and I, I still like occasionally get messages in Korean that I like put into Google Translate so I can read. <laughs> Half of the crew um, sort of only spoke Korean. Some were bilingual. Some only spoke English. Like some of the crew were American. And, and so it, it was this like beautiful mesh of people working together and really enjoying working together and also figuring out how to talk to each other as we went. It was a really wonderful experience. And was there a sense of, I mean, uh, it sounds to me like it was one of those shoots where, you know, the crew starts to, and the cast all start to feel like a big family and like everyone's sort of working from the same playbook. 100%, yeah. And we shot it in um, a re- like a very short period of time, given the amount of stuff we had to get done. So it was that also that feeling of like in the trenches, like having a great deal of fun, but also being under like a, a, a not tiny amount of pressure. Yeah. <laughs> and I think that environment just breeds a, a really, <laughs> breeds a really unique and um, friendly ensemble right. in a lot of ways. Yeah. Did, was, did you feel any, uh, were there any challenges in trying to meet the, meet that pressure or kind of work through that pressure? You just got to make sure you're on top of your shit all the time. And, um, and it, it was a really very unique shoot. Like it, it's a conceit of the show that um, so there were a bunch of conversations and scenes where I would be speaking in English and the person I would I was talking to would be speaking in Korean. And so um, the two of us as actors would have to like figure out like when it was our turn to speak and how to react off of someone we couldn't understand. So just as an example, like that was that was a very unique challenge and like really fun as an actor to sort of figure out how to work with. And, um, and it was very like playful and fascinating. And, and, but also like, that's, that's something we had to be on top of in order to get everything done in time and make sure that we were giving the best performance possible. And when that was done, you came back to, uh, came back to Oz. I did. Yes. Back to Canberra. I did. I, 
Uh, actually, that's not true. I, I came back to Canberra for like two weeks and then I went to Vancouver to film Before I Fall. And then I, I visited the States, came back to Australia, and then in early 2016, I moved to Melbourne. Why, why did you choose Melbourne? I've always liked it better than Sydney. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's where my heart has always lain on the side of that debate. I, Melbourne's one of my favourite cities in the world. I think it's beautiful. I, I really am in love with Melbourne. And as an actor in Australia, you sort of, you do kind of have to pick between Melbourne and Sydney. And um, I've always liked it much better. Yeah. I mean, uh, you're, you're speaking to a Melbourneite, so I can... Uh, yeah. Well, there we go. <laughs> there you go. How good's Melbourne? Yeah, I think Melbourne, I think the, I mean, the artistic community in both Melbourne and Sydney are pretty vibrant, but I mm. definitely vibe a lot better with the, uh, the Melbourne artistic community. Mm, me too. I love it there. Uh, so when did you, from there, when did, uh, when did Top of the Lake become a thing? That's funny. So the timeline is kind of all over the place. I, I auditioned for Top of the Lake with a self-tape when I was in Korea. Right. <laughs> yeah, so, so all, of, all of these live events are kind of stacked on top of each other. But I, um, yeah, one of, one of my fellow actors in Drama World helped me make that tape. I sent it off. And, uh, and then when I was in Australia next, I went to Sydney to um, meet Jane, Jane Campion, and to like, um, have a callback with her. And then she cast me in the room um, wow. just off, off of that. Yeah. And it was great. She sort of turned to me and she was like, cool, do you want the job? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes, I, I, thank you. Yes, I would. And then that, that began, that process was a little slower, I think, because we only began filming that in, when, when did we start filming that? No, we yeah, see, everything sort of blurs together. Yeah. My memory of it is that we started filming Top of the Lake in 2016. I think that's right. Was there, do, were you having any sort of um, perspective about what was happening as it was happening, or was it more you were just kind of in the moment living the experience and... It was just about the work and you were just feeling fortunate to have these opportunities. Yeah, the second one. Yeah, it was really, <laughs> really... I did, really I did kind of ramble of, there. No, no, you're absolutely right. It was, I just sort of rolled with the punches and I'm still doing that uh, and I, I try to do that as much as possible, like rolling with stuff. And, um, and I, di I did feel very fortunate and I do feel very fortunate uh, to, to have the opportunity to put myself forward for... Um, for the kind of projects that I put myself forward. And then sometimes I, sometimes I get to do them and that's amazing. That's kind of magical. Um, at the same time, it, this feels like it's the feeling of being in the right place at the right time, I suppose, or the feeling of um, I'm doing exactly what I need to be doing. Like this is, this is what I'm supposed to be doing. And uh, I think it's probably probably one of the only times in my life I've really unshakably felt that like, Oh yeah, I'm doing the right thing here. This is exactly what I'm supposed to be doing. Well, why do you feel that way? I don't know. Um, but I do know that I, I have never wanted to do anything else. I've never wanted to be anything else. The only thing I've ever had interest in being was an actor. And, and so now that I am one, it, I guess that's sort of, it's the feeling of having that validated of like, yeah, no, this, I was right. I was right about this. Was there any sense of, uh, I guess, nervousness or apprehension with stepping onto something like top of the lake, which, you know, has become such a, uh, kind of prolific show and working with someone like mm. Jane Campion. I was just so excited. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, and I think, um, I really, that sort of feeling of nerves for me, it's not, that feeling isn't, for me personally, that feeling isn't a feeling of fear so much as it is of, um, it's like, it's like an adrenal experience, kind of like, um, about like that feeling of being behind the stage about to step on stage for the first time. I also feel that way leading up into, um, doing something for film and that I'm nervous, but it's not, I'm not scared and I'm not worried, but I am, but I am like buzzing with nervous energy but I'm excited about what I'm going to do with that energy. Right. You understand that you've got it as in, you've got mm. this, like you can handle it, but yeah. there's kind of that, uh, 
not survival instinct, but that, I guess, like you say, adrenaline fueled kind of, um, excitement or I don't know. I don't know. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. Like I've never, I've never been skydiving or like bungee jumping or anything like that, but it is kind of that experience of like, okay, here we go. Yes. This is going to be great. (laughs) Just give me a second. (laughs) I have done both of those things and that was not what was going through my head prior. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. I'd love to do. I'd love to do those things. Well, if you go on my uh, on my Instagram, you can see mm-hmm. videos of me terrified. Um, oh man! Yeah. Where did you do that? Uh, I did the bungee jumping in Cairns, and the Lovely. skydiving in Wollongong. I think. It, Wollongong? Why Wollongong? I think it was Wollongong. They have like. It's no shade. I think Wollongong's beautiful, but I, but I just wouldn't pick <laughs> Wollongong off the top well, of Well, I head. think they just have like a beach and it's not that far out of Sydney, so. Oh, beautiful. I think I'm thinking of the right thing. I, I can't remember. I was, it was, uh, it was a while ago and the adrenaline got to my head. Um, mm. Well, that's fair. I feel like that's quite rational for your brain and body. <laughs> To be like, no, this is fucked. This I mean, my body scary. wanted to do other things, not necessarily just release adrenaline, but... Oh, no. Yeah. It's, it's a gross image. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so do you feel like you... Or what do you feel like you kind of took away from your experience on top of the lake? What did I take away? Uh, mm, I think, um, I think every, everything that you do, you learn from and you grow from. Um, filming top of the lake is really fun because I would sort of, because the cast was so big. So I would sort of roll in for a few days and then be away for a, a couple of weeks. And so every time I would come back, it would be like, what's been happening? What have I missed? How is everybody doing? Um, and so it was, I, gu- I guess that was kind of my first experience of um, being, a, being a moving piece in in a machine where like I would, I would go away and then come back and go away and then come back. It was my first time kind of being a, a recurring character in that way. So you do have to um, make sure that like your performance is consistent, even though like it's, it's you're filming this across months and months and like going away and doing other things and then coming back and playing this character again, you have to find a way to ground it in the same consistency and make sure that you're, paying as much attention as you would be if you were there every day. Um, so that was, that was kind of my first experience with that, I would say. And I suppose coming into uh, Santa Clarita diet, now it's like that experience, but almost on steroids. Yeah, it was definitely a step up. And I think um, a, the, the next step up of what I learned on top of the lake is that um, instead of being there for a few days and then going away for a few weeks and coming back, with Santa Clarita Diet, we filmed three seasons now. So it's it's uh, filming a season and then going away for a year and then coming back and doing another one and like making sure that that your performance is consistent across years instead of across months. Yeah, right. What was the what was the audition process for that like? I it's continuation of a theme. I sent in a self tape <laughs> when I was I was in Melbourne at the time, um, and I sent in a self tape from Melbourne, and then. Um, I was traveling for something else. It was Drama World was coming out. So I uh, went to went to Los Angeles for the premiere of Drama World. <laughs> this, is, this is very funny. I flew back to Australia and then I got a call saying they want to screen test you for Santa Clarita Diet. They want to screen test you for Santa Clarita Diet. You have to fly back. <laughs> you have to fly back to screen test for this show. So I, I flew back a couple of days later. And the customs officer looked at the stamps in my passport and he was like, oh, that's, it says you were here two days ago. <laughs> I'm like, yes, it does. I promise I'm not smuggling drugs. Please let me into your fine country. Everything's fine, I promise. I know this looks very weird. Let me in, it was fine. And then I drove up to Santa Clarita Diet. To, no, I didn't. I didn't drive. I don't know how to drive. I went up to Santa <laughs> Clarita, which is where our studios are that we film the show at and um, I read some scenes with Drew for the creator, a bunch of the producers, some of the writers. It was like a room full of people who were all very nice and who are now um, very dear to me. We've been working together for a long time. 
And then I got a call that I got the role that night. What was it like to uh, step into the room with Drew for the first time? That w- that one I that one was big. I really um really had to kind of like try and keep my cool for that one. Yeah, um, right. <laughs> I mean, she's a big deal. Oh yeah, she's and and she she makes it. She made it so easy. She made it so so effortless because she is so warm and um, kind and just like a generous performer and a generous person. So I. I met her and she gave me a hug and she was like, oh, Liv, it's so good to meet you. And I was like, oh, we're going to be fine. We're going <laughs> to be okay. Yeah. Like, she, she, it's a real credit to her. Um, any any kind of awestruck or, like, nervousness that, that, I was, that I was dealing with, she just really put me at ease the moment we met. Yeah, um, right. And it's, and it's just, she's a dream to work with and spend time with. Was there a feeling like... Or what was the feeling when you got that call saying you'd got the part? It's funny. Anytime, anytime that happens, like because it's your it's your team that tells you, like your agent or your manager, you get a call and, and they're the ones that tell you that you have it. And every time that happens, I go, oh, really? Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> like I'm always, it's always like with a slight amount of surprise. And I think that's because when, when I audition for something, my my strategy to deal with the fact that I might not get it and statistically probably won't get it is that I, I pretend auditions are acting workshops. So I just I just go in, hash it out, and then leave the room and like deliberately never think about it again unless I get called back or or I get the job. So anytime I get the job it feels like this delightful bonus. <laughs> like, it's like, oh that's nice. That's really great. I would love to do that. It feels like this kind of cherry on top because I deliberately train myself to forget that it's a possibility. Um, to, to as a protective mechanism to make sure that I don't get heartbroken every time I, I don't get something because you're gonna, you're gonna not get it ninety nine percent of the time. Yeah, I was just having a conversation actually with a musician and we were talking about the idea that so much of uh, you know being an artist is how do you reconcile rejection or disappointment? Yeah, absolutely. And so my, I think everyone has their own way of doing that, but my personal way of doing that is to just, is to just force myself to be like, no, you, this isn't, this isn't an audition. This is just a class. Like someone, someone has invited you into a room to do some scenes and you're an actor and you love acting. So you're going to go in and do some scenes because this is something you love to do. And then you're going to leave the room and then you're never going to think about it again. And then maybe every so often, if you're lucky, you'll get to do it for money <laughs> like you'll get to do it <laughs> properly with other people um if you're lucky but i the way that i deal with that personally is i'm like well that's not the point i'm i'm going in because i love performing and i want to perform and i'm just going to go in and do that and that's why i'm there and then i'm going to leave and th- that that's the end i think there was a brian cranston quote um that was the, where he spoke about looking at auditions like that's the job your job is to go and audition Absolutely. and then if you get like if you get booked from doing your job then it's just another opportunity to do your job he is absolutely right i think that's so true um i you know for me i'm like yeah your job is getting a job and then having a job is fun <laughs> <laughs> so did you feel like did did things start to change for you at all once you started shooting Santa Clarita Diet or once the first season came out? Yeah, I once the first season came out, yeah, it did, it, things, things did change for me. There was this, I'm trying to just put my mind back, I'm trying to like put, put names to exactly how, exactly how things changed for me. Well, maybe, maybe before going into that, maybe tell me what the process was like of actually shooting that first season. Um, we, sh- it takes like three and a half or four months to make a season, of, to film a season of Santa Clarita Diet. So there are 10 episodes and it takes about six shooting days to make an episode. Um, so me personally, I'll be in there for probably how many of those days? Maybe three of those days, maybe four. Because some of those days will just be Drew and Tim going off and, and killing people and being in love. <laughs> um, and so it's, it's, we have weekends off, filming business days, six days per episode for a few months. 
season one, because I didn't live in the States yet um, and I didn't know how to drive and I still don't, I actually uh, subletted a furnished apartment in Santa Clarita. So I, I like, lived in Santa Clarita while we were shooting season one just because I was like, I don't know, I guess this makes sense because I, I didn't know what I was doing. <laughs> um, and it was very hot and very lonely. But uh, the actual experience of shooting the show was wonderful. Um, and I, I was the I was learning as we went. I was really learning on the job, which was amazing. I, I was learning, you know, what it's like to make American television. We were one of the things that I really treasure about Santa Clarita Diet is that we, as is kind of standard, we work with different directors. Like we have, we kind of have like our favorites who we bring back um, several times a year, every year. And then there are some that like we that we've never met before as actors. There are some that like we have seen before, but not for a while. And so you're constantly learning different styles, like different director styles and like watching someone run the ship in different ways. So it's like a crash course um, in, so, in so many different ways of working, which is amazing. Were there any ways that you found to be more preferable to others? No, not really. I think I'm, I think I'm really greedy. I think I describe myself as very greedy in that, you know, like I... I want to be able to work in, in the States and in Australia. I want to be able to work in like television and film and theater if I can manage it. And I want to be able to work. I want to get to know as many different ways to work as possible. And, you know, also I am in the grand scheme of things, pretty new to this. So just dif- being met with different styles of work is still super exciting to me. And so how did you feel like coming out of that, as I was asking you before, how did you feel like mm. the world sort of changed or things opened up for you f- when that was when that first season came out? I think it's like a natural thing as an actor where like if you once you have something quite substantial under your belt, it makes everything else a bit easier in terms of like you know it's if people if people in the industry like know who you are and like, and have seen you work on stuff and trust you to work on stuff, it just makes, it makes getting future work that much easier. Cause they're like, Oh yeah, I've, I've seen you. Yes. I think you're, I think you're great. Or I think you're terrible. Like get away from me. But like the building, building an awareness and building a body of work and like building a sense of what you can do and what you can be trusted to do is just, just makes the next thing um, so much more within reach. Yeah, and I um I was watching actually just before we spoke, uh, I watched uh, on YouTube uh, uh, what I wish you knew about non-binary oh, that yeah. you put out or that you posted, mm-hmm. and I guess I was interested to know what your experience has been, and I guess if you feel like the profile that you're building for yourself through your work is helping in terms of um, broadening people's perspectives on what it means to be non-binary? I think, so. I, I mean, I hope so. But to be, to be honest, I, um, I've only started talking more about my gender identity, like in public and in the context of my work in the last year. Like I, I came out to my close friends when I was 16 and um. And I, I'll be turning 23 this month, and like that's it. So it's been a long time for me. But um, coming into doing this for a living, I, I always had thought to myself, like, well, that's not going to be an option. Like you, you living authentically as a non-binary person um, in the public eye or like at work is not an option. So don't even bother thinking about it. So I didn't. I didn't bother thinking about it for a long time. And I made, I made like tiny concessions with myself where I was like, well, I don't want to, I don't want to lie. Um, I don't want to actively hide, but I don't think I'll ever be able to actively talk about it. So I would make tiny, tiny little compromises where like I would put my preferred pronouns in like my social media bios or like if, if anyone directly asked me something, I would tell them the truth, but I would never go out of my way to discuss it because I just thought, that's an impossibility. Like it's never going to happen. And it's only in the last year or so that I'm kind of realizing that I actually, it, it might be, it might be possible for me to 
be an actor and to like have a public presence and be open about the fact that I'm not binary that that actually might be possible for me to do. And um, the the what I wish you knew video, I was a I was approached by the director and the production company that were making it for Netflix because they had um, they had an awareness of me as a non-binary person. And so, for instance, like I, <laughs> that was an opportunity for me where I, they, they were like, we would love to do this with you. And so I had to look at that and go like, okay, well, am, am I ready to do this? Like, is this something that, and I, is this something that I am ready to dive into? And I realized the answer is yes, yes, I am. I am ready to do this. I, it is a possibility. I can do it and I'm going to do it. Um, so I think it's going to be a process. It's going to be a long process, but I'm not, it doesn't feel impossible anymore, which is um, quite liberating. Yeah, I could imagine it must be very difficult to, well, I, I suppose both sides of the coin uh, in the sense of the, the, the challenge of presenting it in a public forum, but then also living with something that you feel like you can't actively express. Mm, yeah. Uh, and I think it's really only in hindsight that I, that I can appreciate actually how, how damaging that is. Um, and how much dissonance that requires of you. Because, like, it means that, that no one can ever really get to know you, not properly. And that's quite sad, I think. And I think, I guess, circling back to something that you spoke about earlier in terms of feeling very grounded in yourself and feeling grounded mm. in the world and with what you want to do, it, it would make... It, I, would, I would imagine it would make that feel almost impossible. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, or like, you know, there's this, it's a, and it's a cruel thing to internalize that um, a really massive part of you is not acceptable or not welcome. So un unpacking that um, can only ever be good. And so, you know, I, I, I want to do that for myself. And it's kind of a nice byproduct of that, that because I am visible, me doing that might help other people do that. How, how did you, if you don't mind my asking, how, how did you identify in the first place that you didn't fit into either of these kind of traditional gender ideas? Um, well, when I hit puberty, I melted down. <laughs> <laughs> uh, for starters, I, I never felt, um, I've never, the word female or like the idea of like womanhood has never resonated with me. Even when I was a child, I was like, well, I guess I'm a girl because everybody says so, but there's nothing inherent about me that I feel attached to with that. Um, it's like, well, I, I mean, I guess, cause I don't know that there are any alternatives, but like that, to be honest, I'm not super invested in that idea of like being a girl or being a woman. And then I hit puberty and uh, everything, everything was terrible. <laughs> um, <laughs> and then I, I, I actually, uh, I suffered from uh, anorexia when I was a teenager for, for a chunk of time. And it was really hor It was really horrible. It was really dangerous. And I, I was in serious medical danger for, um, for a minute there. And in going in submitting to recovery and in going to therapy and in kind of like unpacking these things for the first time, I realized that obviously there's no one cause for an eating disorder. There were like, there were several things going on that contributed to that spiraling out of control. But one of them, a big one of them was that, um, I was hitting puberty and my body was changing and I could not deal with it. I, I was starting to be looked at and talked to and treated like, um, a, like a woman and, and it was awful. <laughs> and, and it wasn't for a long time. I was like, Oh, well, I guess I'm just a woman who hates herself. But in going to therapy, I was like, Oh no, 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 I'm not a woman at all. That's the problem is actually deeper than that. It's not that this is what I am and I'm finding it unpleasant. It's that this is wrong. And the dissonance of this being wrong is part of what's causing this deep psychological distress that I'm taking out on my body. And, um, and I didn't really know what to do with that. And so I sort of sat on it for a little while, trying to come to terms with it privately. Because I didn't, I didn't have any of the language for what that meant. So I didn't really tell anyone. And then I, I knew I wasn't straight. 
So I, as I got older, I knew I wasn't straight. I've always been like very interested in sociology. So I was doing a lot of reading and uh, in trying to learn more about myself, I was doing a lot of reading about like queer theory and like LGBT history. And I came across the word non-binary for the first time. And it was like, oh, fuck, hmm. that's, that's it. Jesus Christ. Like it, it was, it was a real lightning bolt moment for me. Yeah. And, and that changed everything. Like just the awareness of like, that's, the, it, it has a name. Like it's not, this isn't some monstrous insurmountable problem. This is, this has existed throughout history and there's a word for it and there are other people dealing with this and it makes sense. And that was massive. What was it about that or, or what you read specifically that, that, that resonated with you? Um, just the idea that like there are, <laughs> it's, that it's that it's okay that you're not going insane you know there's nothing the feelings that you're having are, it's not like a symptom of there being anything terribly wrong with you and like it's not and, and it's possible this is possible to talk about you can't talk about something unless there are words for it mm. so like this it, you this is this can be spoken about this can be expressed this can be lived and that's okay. And that's, and that's beautiful. And, and so the, yeah, it was a sense of like, not only there's, there's a word for this, but also, Oh, I'm going to be fine. Like I, I know what's going on for me and it's fine. And how did your, again, if you don't mind my asking, and if you do mind me asking, mm. tell me to fuck off, but um, that's fine. how did your parents or family, when you did come out to them, how did they respond I sort of, um, I was very tentative. Like I, I mentioned, I sort of came out to my friends at 16. And then I, it, it was super slow. The process was really slow burn over a number of years. Like I would, I would tell, I told my inner circle of friends. And then I would tell like a little bit more of my friends and a little bit more. And I would tell them it was okay to tell other people eventually. And so it wasn't as... Um, it wasn't as cut and dry as, as telling people that I was gay. Um, it was, it was much, much slower and much, much more hesitant. So I, um, I only started explicitly having conversations about gender identity and my gender identity with my parents, like a couple of years ago, I would say it was really slow burn. I, I wanted to tell my family, um, for a long time and sort of didn't really know how to, and was quite, scared of doing so not because I thought they wouldn't understand um because my I'm very lucky my family is amazing I knew that was going to be fine but I just I just didn't know what that conversation would look like and I didn't know what that would mean for our relationship and so I it was um it was this big scary thing for a while so how I dealt with that is that I would um I would have conversations with them about gender in general over a long period of time and I think because the, then my parents, at a certain point, it was like, oh, you're you're getting at something. You're like you're you're <laughs> building to a point here. Like, right, oh, yeah. this is a, this is important. We should pay attention to this. What you keep coming back to this subject? There's something here. So by the time I started having conversations with them about gender and me, they were like, ah, I see. Yes, we thought we thought something like this might have, might be going on. Was there a sense of relief? when you finally did, were able to have that conversation with them and feel like, you know, you, they were supportive and, and that you were kind of moving forward with not much changing. Yeah. Yeah. It's massive. And, you know, and we still talk about it and a lot of those conversations are ongoing and, you know, there are, there are things that they're curious about and things that I want to share with them. And, and that's a process that will continue into the future. And so, yeah, just the idea that, that we can talk about it and we will talk about it. Um, that's really nice, especially for so long that my massive fear and, um, and my certainty was that, well, I'll, I, I will never be able to talk about this with anyone. And so the fact that that's not true is, um, yeah, kind of un unspeakably important. Yeah. And I guess not only that, but like we sort of segued into this conversation with, the profile that you're building for yourself is allowing you the platform to, uh, I guess, 
help other people feel less isolated who, who may be going through similar things. I hope so. Yeah, I really hope so. I guess on the back of that conversation, I, saw, I did see that you were talking about starting to or even being in the process of writing your own material that would see non-binary characters. I'm not sure mm. if it's in um, theater or film or television, but that would see non-binary characters introduced into that kind of work. Mm-hmm. From, from this kind of vantage point, what would you see as being kind of uh, successful steps forward in your career? And I guess when you began your career, how would you have seen uh, or defined what success was? When I was younger, um, I would say uh, as kind of like a pithy joke, but I was also pretty serious. I'm just going to keep doing this and hopefully someday someone pays me. (laughs) And it would make the people around me laugh. And I was like, no, I'm serious. <laughs> like, I'm just going to keep doing this and hopefully someone paid me. And, and that's, that's happening now, which is great. So, you know, just, that's possible and that's wonderful. And the, the writing, I, I've always written, but I, I've sort of let it slip by the way a little bit over the last few years because um, the, like, act, acting has transform my life in a lot of ways and um so I, I don't know I've been busy <laughs> so this year I'm really trying to um get back into scribbling some more and I I'm I really really want to explore creating work that um centers non-binary characters just because I I can't think of any and I'm selfish and I and I want to I want to <laughs> play non-binary people and I want to see stories about non-binary people um so I'm gonna do it I guess but that process is really long. That's a really long, ambitious process, writing something and getting it off the ground. So it's really in its tentative baby stages at best. But that's a goal for the future is, is to create work like that. Yeah, I think, it's a, I think that's it's a pretty great goal. Um, and, I, and I hope to see you succeed with it. And I'm, I think as, uh, as fucking crazy as the world is right now, it seems like in a weird way, it's also opening up a lot. And at least there's a lot of conversations Mm. being had. Yeah, I think so too. Um, thank you so much Liv for, uh, for chatting with me on the show. I end all of the interviews with the same question, which is Mm -hmm. what makes you silly? Oh my God. I don't, (laughs) you know, um, actually I do have a good answer. I'm sitting at the foot of my couch right now. And uh, I, it's lying upside down, like lying, lying with my head below the rest of my body and like having all of the blood rush to my head. That makes, everything's funny when you're upside down. <laughs> and, and you sort of stop doing it after you're a kid. But I remember even in high school, my friends and I would lie on benches with our heads kind of like below the bench. And I guess it was kind of like getting high. Like just, just having all the blood pull to your brain and just think everything's hilarious for five minutes. But that's a guaranteed way to get yourself silly. It is a guaranteed way to get yourself silly. Thanks so much, Liv. Thank you.